right? That, uh, hey, there it is. Well, uh, everybody's pull up Facebook, Facebook our Facebook page, page and see if we're live and see oh, how I this is going to work. I haven't got a notification. Yeah, since, well, uh, we're live. Are we? Do you see me? Can you hear me? Well, <laughs> praise the Lord, as Medea would say. It's yeah. a miracle. Huh? It's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Hello? Hello out there? Well, good deal. Good deal. Uh, they got the side angle on here. Uh, but, uh, hey, it's working. So I'm going to set this down here. And uh, sound sounds good, right? You going to keep it up landing for me? Or are you using it? Huh? No, it's okay. Uh, we've got our prayer list. If we'll go ahead and look over there. And uh, we want to welcome everybody tonight, Wednesday night. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. And uh, for those of you all at home, I can't really, with, with, I'm just looking at the program itself. So, uh, in this, this live stream has, has drawn, it, it's, it keeps me up at night because we've been struggling live feed. So, I just, I talked to a bunch of friends I know, and like, what are you using for live stream? What are you using for live stream? And, and I had looked at these little cameras before, and I decided to go a different route, which has turned to, to turn around and, and bit me in the bottom. Uh, and so I finally said, you know what, I'm tired of fighting it. This is actually a live stream camera built for live stream. You, you, you don't go through any program, and you can control it on your phone or your iPad. So uh, we're going to try it. We're, we're going with that. We're going to see how it works. If it works good tonight, this is the test run, and I'll be able to have it set up Sunday. So uh, two weeks in a row, I've had, well, two, not two weeks in a row, Three weeks ago, I had to redo the service because it it cut off at nine minutes into the service, and so I redid. I went home and redid the lesson, the message, and then last week I used my phone to try to troubleshoot. You know, so I spent time to try and think. Thought I had everything kind of figured out, and then last week it dropped. It got everything up to the message. Maybe that was a tell me something. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. We had the music, we had special music, we had the children's lesson, had the welcome and announcements, the prayers, <laughs> and then, yeah, I, I got up there and I said about three words, and that was it. It was like the Lord's like, stop it, you know, just because. So, I am, I am dedicated to this project. <laughs> it keeps you up at night and busy during the day. <laughs> it, it does, Miss Charlotte. And, and things like that, I don't know. Other things don't, but things like that, I, I just, it, I like watching clean videos. I mean, if, if a video's fuzzy or if a video's choppy or a video's not, and, and that's true with most people, they won't stick around and watch it if it's not a good, clear video. So we lose, we lose viewers and stuff because of its quality. And maybe. So, uh, see, even now, uh, we're, we're, it's working, and uh, it's good. Uh, prayer list, uh, let's look over it tonight and uh, see what all we got going. Any updates on folks that are on our prayer list right now? Emily Delbert had good news. She uh, went, uh, was it yesterday, Monday or yesterday? And did an MRI, and they said oh, everything in her head looked great. The surgery was still looked really good. And then they did a spinal tap to see if it was in her spine, and it came back to say that it was not in her spine. So that's wonderful. It is great news. A good report is always, it's always, always a blessing. Well, Shelly's Shelly's doing okay for the shape that she's in. She's still having some difficulty with her bleeding. She's still, you know, having that uh, problem. But evidently, it's not that bad that that she has to go back to Nashville for them to take care of that. But that's that's she about still it. goes back in another week. Yeah, she's supposed to go back, and they're going to redo the stent. 
but I, you know, I don't know whether they, if she's still having this issue or not. So but that's that's about all I know as of right now. And Lonnie had his MRI, but he has not got the results for that. He has to go back to get results. So. Uh, no, he can take Mike off. He's still fine. Okay. Yeah, last week he was on the doctor got on that and said, you know what this is? We see it all the time and took care of him, so that's good. Yeah, he's doing okay. Yeah. So, Jim, we need to add Lenny and Locke. Lenny, oh, yes. Where, where's that family from? Yeah. From Hickman. Okay, because I first said some people we know from Fulton County had, had posted and then I saw your your little frame. Yeah, I and don't know how many people they said it went on for miles. That's not yeah. the door either. I know. I, I know. It's, it's dark. It is. I don't know. I know. But she was told. She can't afford since she was diagnosed with this. Yes, for sure. Family and and their their faith, the things that they write and the rea they know the reality of what they're looking at. Yet yeah, they know that we serve in a, 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 a big God and a gracious God and a merciful God. But I, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's it, they, I, I don't know how much I know. We talk about they are very. I read that. I had to stop. I had to stop. I, know, I, I had to stop. It. I kept I was like, I had to stop. Four year old baby. No. So it's, mm -mm -mm. It's precious. Has anyone heard from Junior? Did he ever hear from Nick and I? I have not heard. Last time I talked to Mark at Big Plus, they still hadn't heard. Yeah. I haven't heard anything new. I haven't heard anything new. Um, <laughs> but we can, you know, continue to pray and. Is there any, uh, we got Lynn and we're adding her and her family. Is there any new ones? Uh, Wayne's, the arrangements for Wayne, Kim's, Kim's dad? Yeah, uh, he was buried uh, today. 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 Anybody else we want to add? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening and we lift up these names. Father, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us. This is the day that you've made. We will be glad and rejoice in it, Father. Another day that we get to serve you. Another day that uh, we've got to enjoy. Another day that we get to come together on Wednesday night and study your word. Father, we just uh, take this time tonight before we start to, to lift up all these names and these needs on this prayer list. God, you know the needs. We know that you're working in all situations, Father. And we just pray that you uh, will show a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. Father, we know you're a God of healing. We know that you... Uh, you can heal instantly your will father and I just pray that your healing hand will be upon all those father on this list 
There's some that are hurting because they've lost a loved one, Father, and you'll just comfort them and be with them, Father. We have friends and family that are physically hurting, God. I just pray that you will touch their body. And heal them, Father. Father, there are spiritual needs. There are lost people on our list, God, and we just pray that you will save them, that they will come to you, Father. They will turn to you for salvation. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given us, all the things that you've done in our life, Father. Thank you for watching over us another day. Thank you for providing for us. Father, you, you are the good shepherd and you take care of your sheep. Father, I'm just reminded that we're safe in your hands and there's nothing, absolutely nothing that can snatch us out. Father, while we might not fully understand things, God, you do. We've just got to trust you in all things. And know that you are God and you're good. Be with us tonight as we study your word, Father. Thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. Most of all, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ who showed all those things to us at Calvary when he died for our sins. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, tonight we're going to start a, uh, a new study on Wednesday night. Uh, in Genesis, uh, I asked you all last week, and uh, a few of you all had questions that popped up from Genesis, so I thought, hey, this would be a great time to look at the first 11 chapters of Genesis and questions each one of those chapters kind of bring, but we're also going to, it's going to be a little bit different than like Philippians and Colossians and Jonah where we go verse by verse by verse. We're going to do some of that, but I'm going to try to pull out some, some things uh, within the lesson, within the text that uh, uh, we deal with, you know, or may deal with, uh, with the lost world because the uh, Genesis is probably one of the most attacked books. The first 11 chapters, probably one of the most attacked books in, in the scripture. You know, for some reason, folks can believe this book, they can believe this book, they can believe this book, but when you look at creation and when you look at Genesis and God creating the world and everything, and they're like, nah, it's allegory. Nah, every culture had their own creation story. Nah, every religion had their own creation story. Or it's you know it's it's not science and and because it's not science it's not real uh, those kind of things and so I want tonight is kind of more of a little overview than anything is some some questions that we're going to look at kind of the structure of the first eleven chapters uh, and then uh, some other some some definitions of some words that uh, we'll look at and kind of what they mean and how they fit into the Genesis story. Uh, and so we're going to kind of look at the, 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 the name of Genesis, okay? Uh, Hebrew, Genesis means in the beginning. It's the, you know, the first words right there, in the beginning. Uh, I heard someone say this, if you can't believe the first three words of the scripture, you can't believe any of them. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created. If, if, if that hangs you up, if you can't believe that or buy into that, then you will have trouble believing all the scripture because everything hinges on in the beginning, God created. Our faith, everything, it's, it's all, that's, that's where it starts. And I think it's only fitting that it starts out in the beginning. Uh, the English translate transliterated from Latin of the Greek, Genesis means origins uh, or source uh, or creation. Uh, it's the beginning. It, it tells the origins of everything. Uh, 
Genesis is the origins or the beginning of everything. In chapters 1 through 11, these are some of the things that we find. We find three most important men in these chapters are Adam, Enoch, and Noah. They, they, they play, play a very, very a specific uh, role in these opening chapters. Four most important events are creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel in these 11 chapters. Uh, the creation account includes everything from electrons to galaxies, from dinosaurs to dandelions, and from Adam to angels. Uh, all right there in Genesis. Genesis 2.2 and Genesis 2.3 are the only stage which describes God as resting. You think about that. You know, it's like he never sleeps, he never slumbers, but it talks specifically about him resting. Uh, Genesis 1 through 11 includes the first human created, Adam, and the first human born, Cain. Uh, Genesis 1 26 and uh, Genesis 4 1. It records the first man to die, which is Abel, and it records the first man not to die, Enoch. Uh, Genesis 4 8 and Genesis 5 24. The glory of God in creation and the grace of God in salvation are both clearly seen here. The world's oldest civilization, Canaanite, and the world's oldest citizen, Methuselah, they're found in these books. Uh, chapter 4, verse 17, uh, and chapter 5, verse 27. The first marriage, the first murder, and the first promise of the Messiah are found in these opening chapters. Uh, Genesis 2, 23 through 25, Genesis 4, 8, and Genesis 3, 15. The fig leaves are the first illustration of human religion and the first example of divine redemption, the covering of the animal hides. So within that, you have Adam and Eve, uh, you know, basically covering themselves and, and uh, with the fig leaves, which is an illustration of human religion. And then God's divine redemption is found in the covering of the animal hide. So Genesis 3, 7 and Genesis 3, 21. The first rain, the origins of race, and the origins of languages are found in the first 11 chapters. Genesis establishes the basic parameters of living on God's earth according to his precepts in his word. It sets forth the Creator's design and instruction for all that is, including humanity. So on your handout, I put like a little brief outline, uh, and it uses all the little catchy C's, right? Creation, the origin of all things, Genesis 1 and 2. Corruption, the sin of Adam, Genesis 3 and 5, 3 through 5 condemnation, it's the flood of Noah, Genesis 6 through 9, and confusion, Tower of Babel, Genesis 10 uh, through 11. If you happen to ever get an opportunity to go to the Creation Museum uh, and the, the Ark up in the northern Kentucky, uh, they, they actually walk through that, but they also go through uh, Christ. They go all the way through, you know, uh, from creation to Christ and uh, they, they kind of, it's all different stages. It's kind of built around that, and you can go through, and it takes you from the beginnings. So uh, I've got definitions for you, and uh, these are going to kind of be words that we're going to look at, uh, and they're important. Miss Leslie, I'm going to throw some definitions on you. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, it's the first night. Uh, you remember what you said to me the first <laughs> night? Yes. Are you going to talk over my head? <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, you, you keep it well, this you you can do this. You okay. can have it. All right. The first one is biblical worldview. Okay, biblical worldview. Now, a worldview, just a worldview, is the framework from which we view reality and make sense of life and the world. Our worldview. Okay, it's any ideology, philosophy, theology movement of religion that provides an overarching approach to understanding God, the world, and man's relation to God and the world. Everybody on this planet has a worldview. Everybody. It's how they view the world. Uh, it's the way that we look at life and the way we perceive things, okay? So, so 
uh, that the biblical worldview is, uh, where did that part, I thought I had more to that. Oh, I guess I left that out, maybe a, Using the handout and not my oh my goodness. Hang on, let me go down here. Let's see what I've done here. I'm using the handout and not uh, I kept thinking that that's and I might have to use my handout. If I can't find the You've got biblical world view, but I, I did, but I had I have more notes in I my got uh, whole, got the definition I got more notes on my my note notes. Now, what I've done is I think that I have saved awesome. my I've saved my notes on my iPad and not are you kidding me? That's what I've done. We just have to go with it. That's what happens when you get in a hurry. I, uh, yep. <coughs> For some reason today, I broke out and I, my, if you, I, and I was like ready to scratch my, my face and my skin off and, uh, I uh, took a Benadryl and I laid down for just a minute. Uh, let me see if it's if I can find it here. My entire my entire notes, not just. Always use my phone. That's what I did. I've uh, all right. So, so um, yes. So biblical worldview. Now, a a person's worldview is formed in many ways. Okay, uh, the culture, uh, the civilization that the person lives in, their society, their value system, their customs, their art, their heritage, with all of its tradition, traits, and ideas. Uh, somebody that lives in Asia has a different worldview from us because they live in a different culture. They see different things. Uh, people who live in Germany, people who live in Alaska even for a lot of times, they have different worldviews based upon their culture. Education is another thing that shapes our culture. Uh, what, what have you been taught as truth through education system? We are a product of what we read, what we watch, and what we subject our mind to. Those things influence our worldview. Uh, religious beliefs, what we have been taught as matters of faith, these things share, uh, shape our worldview. Emotions, uh, how we feel about a matter can be so strong that it outweighs any other logic or truth. Uh, our emotions can shape our worldview. Uh, and another one is the Bible, uh, belief in God's written word and the adherence to its teachings. Those things shape our worldview. Now, that's a worldview. We're looking at a biblical worldview because as believers in Christ, we want a biblical worldview. And a biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. When you believe the Bible is entirely true, then you allow it to be the foundation of everything that you say and do. Everything that we do, everything that we see, we see it through a biblical worldview compared to the word of God. A biblical worldview takes these things into consideration. Absolute moral truths exist and they are defined by the Bible. There is an absolute truth. See, the world believes that truth is subjective, that it's not absolute. And that goes into a lot of coming from Genesis and creation, evolution, uh, those type of things, secular humanism. If you remove absolute truths from the equation, 
And you say truth is subjective, which means Jeff might say, well, you know, this is, this is wrong. Well, I would say, well, that might be true to you, but truth is subjective, so I don't believe that. And then this person might say, you know what? There are no absolute truths, and I don't, you know, that might be true and right for you, but it's not true and right for me. So we got to establish the absolute moral truth. Uh, another thing to take in consideration is the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. It is God's word for mankind and is completely accurate, including matters of life and its origins. So we would say, as we hold a biblical worldview, that Genesis 1, 1, and all following is the absolute truth of God. It, it, it's the way that it is. Maybe we can't explain it. We might have a hard time explaining it, but it's true because, you know, it's, it's God's word. Uh, another thing to consider is Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God and lived a sinless life, died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and from the grave three days later. Okay? If we say Genesis 1-1 is not true, God didn't create the world and everything. Listen, that removes, completely removes Jesus from the faith period. There was no flood. You know, there, that, that's, that's not true. You know, Adam and Eve, there, there's no Garden of Eden. God didn't create man, Adam and Eve. So Adam didn't sin. So if Adam didn't sin, God didn't have son and son Jesus. You see how that, that works, right? If, 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 if we take away Genesis 1-1 and say, that's not true, we don't buy into that, then that removes Jesus. So a biblical worldview takes that into consideration. Uh, God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, and he still rules it today. When we, when we think of a biblical worldview, that's what we consider. Uh, salvation is a gift from God by individual faith in Christ's work on the cross, and it cannot be earned. That's through a biblical worldview. Uh, Satan is a real being. He's not symbolic, and he wages war against God's children. Uh, people love to believe that angels are real, heaven are real, whether they're lost, whether they're saved. But when it comes to Satan and hell, no. They say it's just an allegory. It's just a myth. He's not really real. Well, that, you know, that's, that's a, it's, it's kind of funny that, that people think that way, but they do. Because if they die of the existence of Satan in hell, then they can kind of deny the fact that they might go there or that people might go there. So uh, why does a biblical worldview matter? Why does it even matter? Uh, by diligently learning, applying, and trusting God's truth in every area of our lives, regardless of what that is, whether it's watching a movie, communicating with our spouses, raising our children, or working in the office, no matter how big, how large, we can begin to develop a deep, comprehensive faith that will stand against the continued attacks of our culture's non-biblical ideas. It shapes us. It shapes all our decisions. If we capture and embrace more of God's worldview and trust it with unwavering faith, then we begin to make the right decisions and form the appropriate responses to questions on abortion, same-sex marriage, cloning, stem cell research, and even media choices. When we see things through a biblical worldview, that, that we have appropriate responses to those things. Because in the end, it is our decisions and actions that reveal what we really believe. As believers, we view life through the lens of God's word. That's our filter, God's word. That's our filter on everything. Uh, in a politically heated, charged world, it's important to have a biblical worldview. In a culture that we live in, in America, where it's a free-for-all to believe anything and whatever, especially when it comes to sexuality, when being you know, homosexual, being lesbian, being bi, being trans, being uh, pansexual, which means you're free for all free thing, asexual, uh, more, I mean, you redefine self identity all these things, abortion, it, it just, just all these issues, when we view them, we need to view them through the lens of God's word. 
because we are being bombarded with all kinds of things. Culture is changing so fast, and we got to be seeing things through a biblical worldview. So understanding Genesis in the beginning is the foundation of our biblical worldview. If Genesis 1-1 is not true, then the rest of the Bible is not true. It, it, it all stands on that. And so uh, that's biblical worldview. Now the, the next word is apologetics. Apologetics. Apologetics is the study and practice of giving answers for the reasonableness and truths of the Christian faith. The word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, and it means to give a defense. Uh, Peter used it in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, uh, be ready to give a reason or a defense for the hope that is within you. Be ready to give an apologia for the hope that's in you and the, the defense, okay? Be able to be able to explain what you believe and why you believe it. And Christians are commanded to give an apologia to anyone who asks the reason for a hope. So when we are dealing with the issues of origins, what we're trying to do is we're trying to answer questions such as, how did the universe come into existence? When somebody says, ask you that, you know, how did the universe come into existence? When you go to Genesis and you begin to explain that through the scripture, you're doing apologetics. You know, you're just basically, you're given a reason, a defense. Uh, what happened, uh, how did the universe come into existence? What happened to form the stars? How did life come about on earth? How did humans come into existence? What process formed the fossil records? These are all questions, you know, that people ask that have to do with creation. And uh, you do apologetics. You're given a defense. So by knowing foundational truths found in Genesis 1-1 and, you know, on through 11, we can, we can address some of these things. My seminary president, that was his area of study. You actually can be in the apologetics that go into that field of study. And uh, he travels all over the world and does debates with humanists and atheists. And uh, he's wrote tons of books. He's one of the, the big apologet uh, apologetics uh, people around. Uh, Ken Helm, that I told you the extra in the gym, he's an apologist. Uh, a guy named Josh McDowell. I don't know if you remember Josh McDowell. Uh, he, he's, an he's one of the leading <coughs> apologists. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, who just passed away not long ago, he was an apologetics uh, person. And so there's people that that's what they, that's, that's their field of study that they're passionate about and they go you know, all over the world. And uh, they usually, they do a lot of debates. Uh, they debate, you know, atheists and people that don't believe in creation. So that, that's just another word that you'll see pop up uh, as we study this. And here's some other things, the gap theory. When we look at creation, the gap theory. According to the gap theory, there's a very long span of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. So if you look at Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it starts verse 2. It says, The earth was without void, form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. The gap theory states that in between verse 1-1 and 1-2, there are millions of years that existed in between that, okay? Uh, the world that existed during this gap was destroyed and God recreated in the six days described in Genesis. Uh, a lot of people that believe the earth is millions and millions of years old, this is the one way they try to justify it uh, by, by the gap theory. Genesis 1-1 refers to God's initial perfect creation. Everything that God made was beautiful. There was no sin anywhere. And verse 2 assumes that a great catastrophe occurred that caused the earth to become a chaotic state through the judgment of God. The formless and void state as recorded in Genesis 1-2 is in direct contrast to the perfect initial creation. So if the gap theory is true, and here's the key word, theory. Okay, theory. A theory, all of us can have a theory on something. A theory is something that's not even been proven. It's actually an idea, and, and there's nothing to back it up. So if that's true, what it's saying is, is God created, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
Well, something catastrophic happened that God had to destroy. So in essence, what's that saying? God didn't do enough good job the first time, so he had to recreate. To me, that would remove God from being God. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And so that's that's a big, you know, that's a big thing. So uh, the ideal fails because it lacks biblical support and it puts death before sin. There's an order that goes on in creation. It's not random. It's not happenstance. It's not like God woke up one morning and said, hey, today I'm going to do some birds. There, there is a method. There's a reason, an order for everything that he did. Uh, scripture describes death as the consequences for sin. And those holding the gap theory contend that this state of ruin could have possibly lasted millions of years. Some people also say that the fall, the rebellion of Satan, and the third of the angels happened during this period. That's kind of when they placed that. So uh, next word is evolution. I'm sure y'all are familiar with evolution. They taught evolution when I was trying to, I was remembering. It wasn't that big of a deal when I was in school. It was just kind of tall. And we just kind of like, this is, this is Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And we talked about survival of the fittest in our science books. But all my teachers in elementary school, for the most part, I knew they were believers in Christ. Uh, you know, my family knew them. We knew them. Uh, we were in a small community. Uh, they taught it. They didn't teach it as truth. They didn't teach it as another option. You know, it wasn't... Uh, Creation was still taught in the textbook then, as you know, as well during that time. And it really wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, it is now. It is now. Uh, evolution is the supposed process. Now, once again, it's the theory of evolution. This is the amazing thing. Evolution is the supposed process by which the first cell evolved into the diversity of life we see today. So the theory of evolution says... A single cell organism climbed, climbed out of some goo, right? It turns into a fish. The fish sprouts legs. It then evolves into other creatures, which eventually evolves into a monkey, which eventually evolves to a man, okay? That's, that was it. And uh, natural selection is in the evolution. That's what Darwin called survival of the fittest. He says natural selection and mutations are considered as driving force. Okay, so so there's got to be something there. There's got to be constant mutations. Always happening. My question is, is, why don't we see people walking around like half monkey, half man? You know, I'm just like, why, why aren't people? Yeah, well, it is. I know, yeah. We can't even, I mean, he's making Slim Jim commercials now or uh, <laughs> beef jerky commercials. But uh, that's, that's all, that's what it hinges on. However, evolution has never been observed. It's never been observed. Nobody sat there and said, hey, that's evolving right before our eyes. That, that organism is turning into a fish or that fish is growing legs. Nobody's ever observed it. Uh, natural selection of mutations cannot add the information necessary to change one kind of creature into another. This theory was the work of Charles Darwin, and even though it's just a theory and has never been proved, it has been taught and taken as legitimate science and fact. Isn't that amazing? It, it still amazes me that even though it's never been observed, even though it's a theory, it cannot be backed up with science. It's still taught as science and as fact. Darwin had a good imagination. He did. And you know, even towards the end of his life, he pretty much had decided that all his research on this was, was not true. He, that he's, he messed up and missed it. It was just uh, very exciting, huh? It, it did. And, and look how he changed. I know and that one man has changed it's changed. Now, evolution's taught as science, but it's really not science at all. It's more of a religion. Evolution's more of a religion. It has followers. Or an anti-religion. It, it, well, it, it, religion in the sense of, you know, everything else that people worship and follow after. 
Um, I mean, secular humanism, naturalism, all these things are based on evolution. And so uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's called a religion, but it's not. It's, I mean, excuse me, it's called a science, but it's not it's actually a religion. And within evolution, there's natural selection. But here's the thing about natural selection. When discussing natural selection as a possible mechanism for evolution, it's important to define the terms. Trying to go over. Yeah, I see it. Uh, evolutionists and biblical creationists view these terms differently. So natural selection is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay? Uh, and this is what I mean by that. It comes down to how we interpret the evidence in light of our foundation. Do we view natural selection using God's word as our foundation, or do we use man's ideals as our foundation? Now, the creationist view of natural selection is supported biblically and scientifically. From a creationist perspective, natural selection is a process whereby organisms possessing specific characteristics survive better than others in a given environment or under a given selective pressure. What's that saying is, and it makes, I mean, an animal, let's just say dog A, winds up in this part of the world, due to its situations and circumstances, it may survive based upon its genes and its genetic makeup, or it may not, based upon its environment. You know, it might be stronger. It might be, I mean, eagles. Eagles, if they have, you know, if they have multiple babies, eagles will basically kill the weak ones in order for the strong one to live. And so, you know, natural selection is tied to evolution, but it's also actually real science, uh, you know, and, and it's, it, it depends on how you view that. Um, those with certain characteristics live and those without them diminish in number or die. That's why animals become extinct, you know, through natural selection. Some make it, some don't. Uh, you see that, you know, in farm, in farm life, some of the animals and stuff, you know, just even in our everyday going about. Natural selection is a God-ordained process that allows organisms to survive in a post-fall, post-flood world. Uh, in its observation, reality that occurs in the present and takes advantage of the variations with the kinds and works to preserve the genetic viability of the kinds. And when it talks about kinds, it talks about like dogs, you know, animals are a kind. Okay, um, a wolf is a kind, but a coyote and St. Bernard and a chihuahua and a labradoodle, and they're all kinds of dogs. They're kind of like, you know, they don't become something else. You know, you can domesticate them, you can breed them. They stay within the kind. And so uh, that's, you know, that's just, that's, the fall of man changed everything and the flood changed everything. And so some animals made it, some didn't. You know, some, some were, you know, the, the flood displaced everything. It changed the environment. The environment was good for some to thrive. The environment was not good for some to thrive. And so those things happened within, you know, the, 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 the fall and the flood. Uh, the changes that are observed today show variation within the created kind. It's a horizontal change. Now, for a molecule to man, evolutionary model, okay? They're saying from a molecule to a man. Why would it say from the, oh, I can't remember, from the goo to the zoo to you. Somebody <laughs> said, I can't, that, that, that's kind of, I can't remember who, how they said that. I have to look it up. Uh, yeah, because he was talking about evolution. He said, yeah, I said, teach from the goo to the zoo to you. So that's kind of what it's talking about here. Within natural selection, there must be a change from one kind into another kind. So they're saying natural selection is, is a dog changes into something else. You know, huh? But it, but it never does, right? It never does. Person came from a monkey. Why do we still have monkeys? <laughs> I know, I know it. Well, Luke and Jacob both asked that question. When, at, yeah, they, you know, Simple. Simple question. And Simple. science. Yeah. Like, what yep. is going on? Well, where does the goo come from? Huh? 
Where'd the goo come from? You know, it was, it was just, you know, it just, there was some goo there and <laughs> something crawl out of the goo, Miss Leslie, and then, you know, well, where, where did the goo come from? That's yeah. it. That's it. Um, but it's or, important to see natural selection as a mechanism that God used to allow organisms to deal within their changing environments in a sin-cursed world, especially after the flood. So natural selection, even though it's attached to evolution and the survival of the fittest, it's 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 it's, it's how you view it within it, you know, within its parameters in, in a, a post-flood, post-fall world. So does that make sense, or have I confused everybody royally greatly? You just think how the, the things that never seen a, a thorn or bramble, mm -hmm. how they, what caused all the thorns mm -hmm. other than God? Yep, that's right. <clears throat> so the next is the Big Bang Theory. I'm not talking about the TV show. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Big Bang Theory is a naturalistic story about the origin and development of the universe beginning with a singularity when all mass, energy, and space was contained in a small point. Uh, Big Bang Theory says that the world and universe got here. At one single point, there was this massive explosion. All the stars and the planets were put in their spots. And they all ground themselves off pretty and round as they... Yeah. <laughs> and the cool thing about this is is they knew exactly how the earth, the axis of the earth is supposed to tilt. You think about this. If we were tilted one degree closer to the sun, we would cook. We would burn up. If we were just tilted one degree more away from the sun, we would freeze. It would be a big iceberg. One degree. Just so happened when things exploded that the earth was on the axis and the, just the right amount of distance from the sun, they're all placed in order. That, that's the big bang, that's what they say. Now, the, the Big Bang is riddled with problems and most importantly, contradiction. it contradicts the biblical teachings of creation. There's no God, in the beginning, God created no, nothing, not a zip. It just happened, boom, it exploded. The Big Bang is bad theology and is also bad science. Um, the Big Bang isn't testable, repeatable laboratory science. Uh, it can't be. It can't be. You know, proven. Can't test it. It doesn't make specific predictions that are confirmed by observation and experimentation. In fact, the Big Bang is at odds with a number of principles of real operational science. I don't really remember all the stuff from basic science class, but you know, when you did, you, you had to make the observation and you had to write your theory what would happen. And you had to observe it, and you had to keep, you know, logging that down. You had to do tests and stuff to kind of prove or disprove, you know, what you were doing. Well, the Big Bang can't can't even be like with basic freshman level science class can't be can't be uh, can't be verified, can't be proved. Nothing to something. That's all. That's yep. So the next one definition is intelligent design. Now that's an interesting one because it sounds great. And it sounds biblical, okay? And t the intelligent design movement is led by scholars who argue that the design of living systems and even the non-living elements of the use universe suggest a designer, okay? They say that, yes, we agree that, that the world and everything in it could not get like it was or like it is unless there was an intelligent designer. They're getting closer. But here's the thing. While these intelligent design proponents have been effective in challenging evolutionary theory, intelligent design fails to reference the God of the Bible as the designer. designer. <laughs> yeah. so, so they're getting close, but yet, you know, it's kind of like, 12 step program. The, the higher. Well, here's, here's the thing. If you say it was, here's what it all hinges on. And, and all these things hinge on this. If you say that God from the Bible created it, 
then you have to say the Bible is true. And if you say the Bible is true, the reality is, is that we're sinners separated from God. And if we're sinners separated from God, then we need a Savior to die for our sins, which is Jesus. So by removing God completely out of that, the, the thought is, I'm off the hook for all that. I don't have to admit that. No, they don't have to admit that. <laughs> they don't, right? <laughs> yeah, and you're, it's just like, you know, the, just because, you know, the Pharisees, he said, you're not my sheep. They were still accountable for their unbelief. No matter what kind of a thing we make yeah. up, I mean, we make it up, but that doesn't make it true. And we, God, what God says is true. It, it is. It I mean, is. any of these theories, if God told me that he was behind them, I'd believe it 100%. But what he says is in the beginning, God created. That's right. Yeah, so and that's why, that's why, that's that's why, why everything mean. hinges yeah. on that first verse. It, it really does. Because... <laughs> Everything that we believe, you know. I think God could have done any of these things absolutely. had he chosen to. But he didn't choose to do it that way. And he gives us a whole picture of how he did it. Basically, they're admitting there's a designer, but they're in denial of who it is. Yeah. Now, now, there might be some, you know, let's see. Well, the next one is creationism or biblical creation. Biblical science, biblical creationism has made a lot of leaps and bounds over the years. Uh, one of the reasons why it never did is because science never considered them scientists. Like the Bible's not science. Well, the, the, the Bible is science. The Bible created science. The Bible created physics. The Bible created, in the beginning, God created science. He created physics. He created astronomy. He created biology. Molecular structure, physics, chemistry, everything. He's responsible for it all. <clears throat> and so uh, the, the, the Christian scientists that, that, that believe in you know, Genesis story and account, they're actually, there's a lot of them that are now getting some foothold. They're getting some research. They're getting noted and everything. Uh, but that used to not always be the case. Now they're they're made you know they're discredited, of course, by other scientists that says it's not real science because it's the Bible. But it is creationism and biblical creation. That is the doctrine holding that matter, the various forms of life, and the world were created by God out of nothing and in the way described in Genesis. That's that's kind of where we're at. That's where we're at, where we should be at. <laughs> you know that that's that's us. Uh, we're 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 biblical creationists, okay. And so uh, there there's the the next term below is old earth creationism. I threw that in there too because as we get into the creation of the world, there's young earth and there's old earth. Well, the old earth creationism is the belief that the earth is millions and millions of years old while still believing in the creation account in Genesis. Uh, I am a young creationist. I believe that. Uh, about 6,000 years old. If you look at the genealogy that's in the scripture from Adam, you know, they, he gives a genealogy. It's about 6,000 years there. And so, but folks try to still justify the millions of years. And so there's this ever raging war between young creationists and old creationists. The world is young. And you'll, you'll read anywhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. And then you'll hear the old creationists like, no, nope, it's older, it's millions of years old. And a lot of that is to try to justify a lot of the other things, questions like dinosaurs and the age of the earth and carbon dating and how they, the rock formations and everything, which in the nutshell before we're going to get there, flood changed everything. And if God, you know, we kind of think when God created the world and everything in it, he could create the earth to look older than what it is. I mean, Adam was a full-grown man. He wasn't a baby. Not necessarily did he create all the sap. Like, I'm going to create saplings, and they're going to grow into big trees. He means God. And so uh, that's... To me, that argument really takes away from 
a lot of time that could be spent because it's been between believers. We believe the earth is young. We believe the earth is old. And to me, there could be more time being productive. But it's just, once again, it's like, I believe this based upon this, 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 and I'm not budging from it. So, I'm not. Well, they're saying maybe if they keep arguing about it, you can't prove that they're wrong. <laughs> I know, some people just like to argue, Jim. That's, uh, yeah. As long as they keep arguing, they, have, they don't have to admit they're wrong. That's right. So, the, finishing up, here's some questions that we're going to cover and look at while we're going through this. I don't know how many weeks it will take. You know, we got 11 chapters. Uh, we're not going to go through it like boom, 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 like, you know, in detail. A lot of it, I'm going to try to pull out stuff and everything. But as we go, we're going to look at the text. Uh, we're going to look at what the words say. We're going to kind of look at the significance of them. But then we're going to answer some questions that fall in there. Uh, is the world millions of years old? Uh, are the six days literal 24 hours? That's a big deal, folks, too. Okay, that's, that's, that's a big, big thing. Uh, where do dinosaurs fit in? Uh, where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> we're <laughs> we're going to get And I looked this. it up. Uh, why are there so many different languages? Was the flood worldwide or local? That's a big deal. Some people say it was the local flood in the Our area. River just flooded. That, that's it. That's it. Is there more than one race? How was the world, what was the world like before sin? Um, how did sin change creation? And then I want to, because I think this is like the most important thing of all, is where's Jesus in Genesis? We'll finish up the, each night. You know, there's a type of Christ and there's symbolism in the book of Genesis. So we're going to find Jesus. It's kind of like, you know, where's, where's Waldo? Kind of like, where, where's Jesus? We're going to find him because he's there. He's all over him. It's, yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's some stuff that like a lot of people have a lot of interest in. Uh, if you have questions or you think of questions, write them down. You can send them to me, or you can bring them to me the night of the study, and then I can take them back and I can kind of research them uh, and, and get back, you know, later and, and get some answers the best I can. I am not a. Uh, I've had some apologetics classes, but I'm not a you know. That's not my field that I studied. Uh, and so I, I, used to, I used to teach this a lot to students because they like it too. Plus it kind of hit their world a little bit more because they're in school. And so they dealt with it quite a bit and they heard the terms and everything. And so, uh, but I'm a little rusty, so I might have to. Yes. He had a Bible study. Uh, Bible study. Um, apologize. I, it wasn't my idea. Remember Melissa Willow yeah. was coming here. Oh, yeah, she was the one that wanted to do it. And I have to tell you that I never really fully understood it. I still don't. <laughs> to me, I think of apologetics.